Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in the newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us now begin our worship with my shepherd. You supply my need, hymn number 782, in the back of your worship. And number 782. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church here in Springfield, Ohio. We're glad to have you join us today as we bring our worship to you. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue. It's our hope and prayer that these moments will indeed be a blessing to you this day. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508. Please call our church if you desire membership or have any questions about our service.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
happens favorable or unfavorable, convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with the sound doctrine, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away from this. As for you, always be sober, endure suffering, and do the work of the evangelist. Carry out your ministry fully. The word of the Lord. Thanks.
So that's putting the proper focus in our prayer. We are acknowledging God as our Father and Creator. We are acknowledging that His name is holy and should be treated with respect. We acknowledge the fact that the greatest thing that could happen is for us to see His kingdom come. And that in daily life we want His will to always be done. Then we start the petitions for those things we need each day. Give us this day our daily bread. Now notice, the prayer is not saying give us T-bone steak and lobster tail every day for a minute. It's saying our daily bread. Whatever we need to sustain us from day to day. As we hear all constantly from uh, the Center of Disease Control, from the American Cancer Society, from uh, the American Diabetes Association, from all these different groups concerned about our health, we hear constantly how we as Americans consume too much when it comes to eating. That we make lavish meals out of everything and that we don't need to eat that much. And that how certain things are harmful us, for us that we are eating. And how we'd be better off taking in less calories or taking in less sugar, or taking in less fat and so forth. So in the prayer we're simply saying that God would make sure that we have enough to sustain us from day to day. Not that we have a Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, Easter Day meal, every meal of the day. Then we pray for forgiveness. That God will forgive our sins and help us to forgive those who sin against us. And then to lead us not into temptation. To enable us to slam the door on Satan when he comes tempting us to do that which we know is wrong. And then to deliver us from evil. That God not allow us to be in the presence of evil, but if we are to deliver us from that evil. And then we have the conclusion, for thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So that's the model for us to pray. That's showing us what we need to pray for, the important things in life. And so when we have conversation with God, he always sends us an answer, but it may not always be the answer we want to receive. A lot of times when we pray to God, we pray the preconceived answer that we want. We want success. We want healing. We want peace. We want something. And so, God does answer us, but He can answer us in a number of different ways. He can say yes, which we would be glad for. He can say no, which at the time we might not understand, but later on realize that our petition that we were asking for really wasn't in our best interest. He can say wait, because the answer to prayer right now might not be in our best interest. I can remember personal experience when I entered seminary. I was in my first year of seminary, I was still dating the young lady I was pinned to in college. And if you don't know what to be pinned is that when you're in a fraternity, you have a fraternity pin and you would go over to the girl long enough and would give her that pin to wear. And that was like a step before becoming engaged. So I came up to Hannah and was pinned to this young lady. Still was at Transylvania, so every weekend I was driving down to Lexington. Uh, occasionally she would come up here. And then the beginning of my second year in Hamlet, she dumped. So then I began to panic. Here I was, 22, getting ready to go on 23, with no wife, and three more years of school, and wondering would I ever find a wife. And would I ever be married? If I wanted to be married, I'd probably go become a Catholic priest so they can get married again. But I kept praying to God for a while, and he kept telling me things until he brought me Jean. And the rest is his. So sometimes God tells us to wait, because if we would answer that prayer immediately, we might make the wrong decision, or the wrong choice, or be in a, in a wrong situation. Also, when we pray, he may not give us what we want, but something else, because he knows that is better for us than what we were asking for. And when we receive that, we're amazed that 
God knew better than us what we really need. Now, we should be admitting it's because God obviously knows better what we need. But when we pray for something else and God gives us what we really need, then we are amazed. Another time that God may not answer your prayer, and I know there have been times in my life when I've done this and I was so thankful that God didn't answer that prayer, that He did say no. I mean, He answered it, He said no. And that is when we pray out loud. Something has happened and we pray a negative prayer to God, asking Him to do something negative to whatever we're mad at. Or to give a negative prayer to Him in a position of adversity. Sometimes when we're in adversity, we pray that God would play those putting us in that adversity or causing that adversity instead of following Jesus' words which are pray for our enemies and those who persecute us. So God always answers prayers, just not always the way we may want Him to answer. Now William Proctor, a Christian scholar, theologian, on the topic of prayer has said this, quote, Many of our prayers fail to enter heaven for the same reason that a whole generation of Israelites failed to enter Canaan because of unbelief in the Lord. You recall that when God called Moses to go down to Pharaoh and demand that he let my people go, that Pharaoh, after ten plagues, found him released the Hebrew children, they head toward the promised land, he parts the Red Sea. The Hebrew children cross over, Pharaoh's chariots uh, pursue them, and the sea closes up, drowning all them, so they cannot pursue them. As they travel, when they need breakfast in the morning, God provides manna from heaven. When they need supper, meat for supper, he provides them quail. Uh, when they're thirsty, he has Moses touch a rock in cool, cold, what pure water comes gushing out of the rock to quench their thirst. God provides everything they need, but all they did was grumble, 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 complain, complain, complain. And so that older generation, because of all their complaining and so forth, were not allowed to enter the promised land because they did not believe in God's promises. He was making through Moses. For Moses, they reached Mount Sinai and they came to the base. Moses goes up to the Mount Sinai to receive the covenant that God was making with the Hebrew children, turning them into the nation of Israel, to the Israelites. Now, and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. What did the gener older generation do? They go to Aaron, Moses' brother, the high priest, convince them that something has had to happen to Moses, so there's no use worshiping that God anymore, so build us a golden calf and we'll have a new God to worship. Moses comes down the mountain, sees what's going on, takes the Ten Commandments, smashes the golden calf with the Ten Commandments, grabs the golden calf into powder, puts it in the water, makes the people drink it as punishment. And then God's reaction is, they should not enter the promised land. And so then Moses himself, because of something he does, He's not allowed to go to the promised land either, but he is allowed to go up on a mountain and look in to the promised land. And then God takes him away and Joshua leads the newer generations, the younger generations, into Canaan, the promised land. So we're going to practice saying that's what happens with our prayers sometimes, is that we're not praying in faith. We're not praying in belief. We're just praying because we think we have to pray or somebody told us to pray. Or we think it might be a bargaining chip we can use with God. Well, God, if you do this, I'll do that. And unfortunately, my experience has been that oftentimes when people who may use prayer as a bargaining chip never fulfill their end of the bargain. God will do what they want, but then they never do what they told God they would do. Which usually is some kind of promise, like, well, I'll be in church every Sunday, or I'll contribute more to the church, or I'll be more active in church, or so on and so forth. It's amazing once they're healed, they totally forget about that purpose. So God does answer and always hears the true prayer, the prayer that comes from the believing heart. Second thing we learn from our gospel lesson today is that God's delay in answering prayer can be for a greater good. In 
so, again, we go back to our parable, the widow persisted, but the judge kept holding off, kept delaying, giving her her judgment. And finally, he does. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming, or she will not wear me out by her continual coming. That word translated as wear out is a Greek word that comes to us from the world of boxing. It's a boxing term. It literally means to hit someone under the eye. It means to bruise their face. It means to knock them out. So the judge is saying he didn't want this woman to knock it out by her continual. So he finally gives her the good news of the judgment. So now she is extremely happy, happy because she has received that judgment that was she was due, the justice she asked for. But God delays sometimes so that something greater will happen. One example of that is in the 11th chapter of the Gospel of St. John when we read about the death of Lazarus. If you recall the story, Jesus is with the disciples and they are not near Bethany at the time and word comes to him that Lazarus is ill. But Jesus doesn't pick up immediately and go to Bethany to heal his friend Lazarus. Instead, he waits two more days. And he says in verse 4 of that 11th chapter, John, the explanation of why the delay is taking place. When he says, quote, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. End of quote. So God was delaying to make something greater happen. If Jesus had just healed Lazarus, that would have just been another healing of somebody and probably everyone would have had forgotten. But instead, by waiting those two days, Lazarus dies. And Jesus finally shows up. And one of the sisters say to Jesus, you know, if you've been here sooner, our brother wouldn't have died. But Jesus tells him that he's just asleep. And he's going to awaken him. Of course, meaning he's dead, not going to raise him up. And of course, Jesus hollers, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus rises from the dead. So by the way, God did a great thing. Now that spreads all around and that hardens the Jewish leadership more than ever to definitely do away with Jesus. To some, find some way of trapping Jesus so they could turn him over to Pilate so that he could be executed as a rebel, a rebel against Rome. And they can be done with it, or so they thought. But we all know how the story ends. Jesus goes to the cross because that was God's plan of salvation. He willingly goes to that cross and willingly dies on that cross and willingly gives his spirit back to God the Father so that he can pay the debt of sin that we owe. So that we have that forgiveness that rises on that third day so that we may have victory over death itself and go into that eternal kingdom of our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Another example where delay, there is a delay for an important purpose. In the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 9 to 11, we read an in, about an interesting scene that John witnesses. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers and sisters should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves.
vengeance taken on those who had slaughtered them. Even though they knew there were brothers and sisters still suffering under persecution, God is delaying doing any action. He's delaying Jesus coming again in glory. For what purpose? For the same purpose that St. Peter tells us in his second letter. And that is that God delays, but he is not slow in acting the way we think of slowness. Because as I said to him, the day is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. But he is holding off so that more people might be saved. So that more people might come to faith in Jesus Christ. And it has been a historical fact in the history of the Christian church that oftentimes Christianity's greatest gains have been made when it is persecuted. Not when it is protected like here in America, but when it is persecuted. Because when the enemies of the church see the martyrs die witnessing to Jesus Christ, counting their suffering as a honor given to them that they can suffer like Christ suffered. When they see them die in their faith like that, it has an effect on them so that many of those persecutors then become converts to the Christian faith. As one of the early church fathers said, quote, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So in this picture of Revelation, God is delaying the sending of Jesus, even though it means there's going to be more martyrs, even though it means there'll be more persecution, more torture, more death. He is delaying so that more people might be saved. So we see sometimes the delay of God brings us something great. And the last lesson we learn quickly is to persevere. The widow would not give up. She knew justice was hers, and so she continued to persevere in, with the judge until he granted her what she wanted. Oftentimes in our daily life, we have a prayer that is an answer because we quit too soon. Instead of persevering, we give up on that prayer and go to something else. God might be ready to answer that prayer, but because we quit praying and asking for it, switch to something else, then that prayer falls by the wayside. Instead, when we pray, we should be like the white ant of the tropics, of which I am told that this white ant of the tropics will take a firm hold of an object, and it is so determined to persevere in holding that object in its picture to its mouth that it will allow you to pull its body from its head and still not let go. It will cling to that object even when you pull it apart. We are to cling to God in such perseverance in prayer. When we pray, we need to be like that white end, showing them firm hold on our prayer rather than letting go. We are to cling to God in prayer with just such perseverance and determination. So do you feel like your prayers aren't being answered? Well, if you do, then pray, 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 and pray some more. Remember that God always hears the prayer from the faithful heart. That God's delay in answering you can't be so that he can give you a greater good and that we are always to persevere. To always persevere in our prayer. Praying, 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 and praying some more. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ.
begotten, not made, but the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin of Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. St. John practices an open communion. For all those who are baptized and believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, who believe his body and letter through the practice as we gather this table, in our communion age and our own individual congregation, you are invited and encouraged to come forward with us this day as we gather at the table of the Lord. We continue our celebration with a great thanksgiving on page 6 in your worship folder. Again, I invite those who can do so without difficulty. No.
right shift. Closing him is at Calvary. This is October 16th, 2016. Our worship services are at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. here at St. John's Lutheran Church. Our pastor is Pastor John Pollock, organist Greg Nolte, choir director Vicki Perks.
worship service on October 16th here at St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We'd love to have you join us any Sunday. Our service is 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. May you be blessed today.